Hey everyone, mark your calendars. The AHA National Homebrewers Conference, now known as HomebrewCon, will return to Baltimore's historic Inner Harbor this spring, June 9th through 11th. Tickets go on sale next week, Tuesday, March 8th at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Join your homebrewing comrades for three unforgettable days of learning, camaraderie, and delicious beer. Visit homebrewcon.org for details. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 3rd, 2016. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, James Altwise from Gorst Valley Hops up in Wisconsin answers your questions about springtime hop care. What do you need to do to make sure your hops get off to a great start this year? If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And don't forget, uh, get a copy of our Brewer's Logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. If you want to put, uh, put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. And uh, as I've said before, if you contribute via the support link, I'll send you an email with links to uh, bonus videos from this year and the past couple of years. This year, Steve is making Kansas City-style burnt ends out of a chuck roast and cooking up his personal barbecue sauce recipe to go along with it. Some of you have been sending and posting pics and videos of your version of Steve's burnt ends recipe on, on the Twitter and such, and man, they all look tasty. And I made it for the second time two nights ago, and I and I used the leftovers, believe it or not, to make burnt ends omelets. Slice it up and put it in there with uh, uh, some egg substitute. <laughs> Very tasty. Uh, I've been editing together clips from the past decade uh, for the uh, episode 500 quote unquote clip show that's been uh, or that's going to run a uh, week after next uh, when we're in uh, New Zealand. Holy smokes, Uh, there's a lot of content to go through. I've been reading your suggestions and trying to work them in, and uh, it's going to be sort of a needle drop sort of thing. Uh, Just going through and just almost randomly picking out shows and and picking out clips. There are are amazing episodes that aren't going to be represented simply because there's so much stuff out there. And, uh, you know, some episodes that lend themselves to uh, more... Sound bitey sort of things. For instance, how do you lift a representative sound bite from a collaboration experiment episode? You know, how, how do you just get a chunk out of that and, and make it understandable that that's what the chunk is about? It's it's tough. However, I believe the end resort, uh, uh, end resort and end result is going to be uh, quite a fun thing. Speaking of fun things, let's talk about our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. A couple days ago, I brewed my rye wit recipe for the uh, third time. Uh, This is around a five-gallon batch with two ounces of New Zealand Nelson Sauvin hops at the end of the boil. Uh, Now, if you're not recipe, if you're not familiar with this recipe, it is uh, three pounds of malted wheat, uh, and this time two pounds of malted rye, and that's it for the grain bill. No barley. Uh, it's a session beer that will probably be less than 3% uh, ABV, but it will be very satisfying because of the amount of malted rye. And the, the, the rye uh, makes kind of a gloppy uh, wort, and uh, it, it ferments out with with quite a bit of body in it. Uh, anyway, my high-gravity electric brew in a bag system is great for this because I can I can move the lid aside during the uh, the mash rest and stir the mash. 
and uh, all that wheat and malt can become sticky. So being able to reach in there and stir it can really help with the efficiency. And uh, I, I, I love the little knob on the side of the electric controller uh, that allows me to fine-tune the vigor of the boil uh, and to uh, to choose how fast the uh, the the uh, mash comes up to the mash temperature and such as that. But there's there's more exciting news. Desiree and Dave want Steve Wilkes and me to make a video comparing my 240 volt 10 gallon system to their 120 volt 5 gallon system. So that's very cool. I haven't seen the smaller system in person, so we hope to do that uh, soon. So all that to say. Go to HighGravityBrew.com and check out the entire lineup of electric brewing systems. I love mine, and I know you will, too. HighGravityBrew.com Okay, whenever we revisit a topic like growing hops at home, I worry that we'll rehash content that's already in the archives. And that that doesn't happen very much because there's so much to talk about. And it's certainly not the case with James Altwise this week. James not only gave information that's new to me, it gave me a glimmer of hope that I can improve on my performance as a hop grower in the future. James Altwise, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Happy to be here. Thanks. How's it going up there in Wisconsin? Is it spring yet? Well, for hop growers, spring starts in February, but that doesn't mean we're in the field. Uh, <laughs> we... Uh, we just got another few inches of snow today, so uh, but that'll be gone here by the end of the week, and uh, we'll be ready to go and uh, back out, hit it, hit it in the field pretty hard starting next week. So, so what do, what do you do uh, in the fields to start getting ready? Well, obviously everything is still pretty asleep, and it will be asleep until the soil warms up. So, uh, we are going through and basically cleaning up any debris left over from the previous harvest that we. We're sick of dealing with before the winter hit and uh, getting getting any uh, any obvious uh, winter damage fixed, usually in the irrigation lines, which critters decide to chew on what and uh, and get that all repaired. So it's just one less thing to do. And then we start, uh, if, if everything is in good shape, we uh, we can even start hanging twine if we want. Um, of course, on our on our acreage, being much larger than you know most of the listeners, um, we do things like pre-emergent herbicides or okay, we and sometimes we have to cut our plants back a couple of times. So I don't like to get string up too early, otherwise that just gets in the way. Mm. Um, but uh, it's it's basically uh, tightening up the trellis system. Uh, anything that slipped or sagged after last year, because, you know, these are dynamic systems because they will stretch and they will sag. Um, and uh, some sort of make busy work until uh, until the plants wake up. So we haven't checked in in a while. How is the, how's the business going and how is the hop industry up there around uh, your area in Wisconsin? Well, it's, it's uh, I, I believe, you know, it's been a few years, but it is, it is, uh, Interesting as it's ever been, uh, lots of folks um, are excited about the potential of, of growing hops on, a, on a, either a large hobby scale or a small commercial scale, and uh, and we try to encourage that at least uh, at least give them a healthy dose of reality before they get too deep. But uh, but we continue to expand our operation, and uh, we can on all fronts. In the, in the field, in the greenhouse, and in the processing, and uh, basically trying to uh, trying to keep everybody happy and farm at the same time. So very busy. I uh, did an interview a few weeks ago with a, a local brewery here in Northwest Arkansas, and uh, the brewer said that the one of the biggest challenges of starting a new little brewery was getting hops. Uh, you know, and yeah. getting getting the raw materials. So it, it appears that there's no lack of demand for hops out there. Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> there's no lack of demand. I should say yes with an if and no with a but. Um, there is no lack of demand if you have the right varieties. Mm. Uh, and and as most small breweries, uh, commercial breweries start from serious home brewers, uh, those those folks are. Tend to uh, to 
to like to oh hit the uh, hit the really popular varieties um, that are are likely patent protected. So that means they're only grown by a very, very select few people in the U.S. and the world. Really. So that can create some some demand issues, supply demand issues, when they decide to scale up. And uh, I think you've seen probably a lot of that. You know, our typical typical actors like you know Simcoe and Amarillo and Citra and Mosaic and uh, those folks. Anything with a circle R after their name. Pretty much, uh, <laughs> pretty much. That that stuff is uh, is extremely hard to come by, and uh, I would expect, uh, having been on the, because we are also on on several of the committees for the National Hot Growers Association, and uh, having talked with the folks that own those licenses, there's really no plan to expand aggressively in the near future. Mm. So those varieties will continue to become even tighter to, to get a hold of, and prices will continue to climb. So what varieties are you concentrating on? Well, you know, everyone starts out with Cascade, and uh, the Cascade market, honestly, I believe, is going to be saturated in another 24 to 36 months. Um, it's a relatively easy hop to grow, and true, a lot of folks use it. However, there's a lot of it going in the ground, even in the Pacific Northwest. So... I would expect to see uh, no shortage of Cascade hmm. in the in the near future. Uh, we do have some Cascade, although we're we're concentrating on on uh, trying to foresee the future here and uh, and look at varieties that everything old is new again. Let's put it that way. Um, we're looking at some of the older varieties from. Uh, the 40s and the 50s that folks haven't seen too much of that uh, might as well be a brand new hop. Hmm. And uh, we're trying to bring some of those back in production. Uh, Brewer's Gold, Eroica, um, Ramblin' Cross, things like that. Uh, the And then on top of that, or included with that, we're, we're expanding acreage of the new public varieties that came out a few years ago, like Cashmere and Triple Pearl and Tahoma and things like that. So there's good news on the home brewing front as far as you're concerned. Uh, you have been providing uh, hops to the homebrew market, but you're expanding your role in that, aren't you? We are, uh, and and believe me, it's 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 not a it's not a play at all to uh, to uh, compete with our our wholesale customers that have homebrew shops. We're not looking to do that whatsoever, but we have uh, we have requests from social media fans and friends and, and other folks and word gets around that, uh, you know, they can't get into our shop here in Madison, Wisconsin, why being either elsewhere in the country or the world. So we are, uh, we are preparing to very, very soon uh, here within the next few weeks, launch an online web store for home brewers mm. for our site uh, just so they can get our materials directly. Um, but of course, if they're in the areas of our, of our uh, homebrew shop customers, we prefer to see them go there uh, and uh, help support their local homebrew store. Sure, I'm all for that. Uh, what uh, what's the e- or the URL for those of us not in Madison? Well, GorseValleyHop.com uh, can't be any simpler than that. <laughs> and uh, there's a there's a. Uh, uh, a pretty easy to navigate interface there for home brewers to get right to our web store, and uh, it's pretty seamless. Um, you can see exactly what we've got in variety there. Uh, we always, with every variety we plant, we always uh, retain a certain percentage of the harvest, uh, no matter what our our uh, forward contracts look like. We always retain a certain percentage of the harvest for the home brew market. Hmm. So we uh, we try to try to keep everybody happy, but it uh, doesn't always work. But we try. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so what what forms and what uh, volumes are we looking at? Oh, sure. Well, we've got, uh, they're all T90s, uh, T90 pellets. We don't work with whole leaf hops much uh, just because they're, uh, our system is set up to pelletize. And they're available in, I believe it's one, four, eight, and 16-ounce parcels. Hmm. 
And we like to we like to make sure that, you know, you're not paying more for shipping than you are for hops. So, uh, you know, there will be some minimums there. Um, you won't you won't log in and just get one ounce. Uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't really help anybody out. Although if you really are in a hard, hard spot, you can give us an email. We'll see what we can do for you. But, um, but there will be some minimums, and I don't know right now what that looks like. And are those in, in nitrogen flush packages, or how's it go? Yes, these are these are all in in standard barrier bags, so they're triple laminated uh, gas, moisture, and light barrier bags, uh, vacuum sealed, nitrogen purged, and frozen. So every every variety, every lot comes with its own tracking numbers. If there's any comments, questions, or concerns, we can have full traceability for that food product all the way back through the supply chain. So that sounds that, that, that sounds great. Um, yeah, well. We figure, you know, home brewers should have all the all the same access to all the same information and expertise that the that the commercial brewers have. So, well, there you go. Why not? <laughs> well, 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 speaking of home brewing expertise, uh, let's let's tap your brain, shall we? Uh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> let's play stump the expert. I I, I put out sure, the. Sure. Uh, I put out uh, on Twitter that I was going to talk to you, and I got some good uh, questions, and I got uh, also uh, an email question or two. Uh, you know, it is springtime, and, and we've talked about planting hops, uh, you know, a couple, three times on the show throughout the years, but mm-hmm. there's always new questions, it seems like. Uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't know that we've concentrated that much on, on preparing uh, existing hops for the spring, uh, right. But uh, Chad up in Queensbury, uh, New York, says, what are good and easy fertilizer options to start good growth in the spring? And I guess when and how would also be uh, good questions along with that as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, those are excellent questions. And, you know, I think anyone in the in sort of the home gardening uh, world that always hears about, you know, starter fertilizers for your lawn and things of that nature and when to put it on and what type to use and is there a difference really is nitrogen, nitrogen, and um, it's a very good question because uh, timing, everything in hops about quality and quantity of flowers is about timing, Uh, and certainly fertilizer is no, no, uh, it doesn't get a free pass there, so we have to let the plant tell us what to do, Hmm. so a lot of folks get hung up on on, well, I did it about, you know, the second week of May last year, so, you know, I should get out there and fertilize it because it's the second week of May. Not so much. Uh, let the plant tell you what to do. So for hops, when they wake up, hops don't start take, taking up nutrients really aggressively from their roots until the vines are two and a half to three feet tall. So they're busy metabolizing all the nutrients that are stored in their rhizome from the previous late summer. So getting a bunch of, of fast fertilizer down uh, in the early spring when they just start to pop up, you know, you're going to waste a lot of that. It's just going to leach out of the soil or it's going to be, uh, it's going to get tied up by other critters in the soil. So what I recommend for folks is really wait till those plants are a good 12 inches tall. You know, the vines are 12 inches long. They're, they're aggressively growing. And then, you know, for the casual home grower who's just got a, a few plants, um, a very standard uh, general purpose, you know, liquid fertilizer is fine. Um, soluble, the blue kind and others uh, <laughs> work just fine. Um, and, and hops are, are most uh, voracious for nitrogen. And what I suggest for people is once they start with that sort of a, you know, watering can sort of scenario for their hop plants, that they are giving those hop plants a drink of full-strength fertilizer. These are mature plants. Um, So after about year three, give them a a drink once a week Mm. of that full-strength fertilizer until flowering starts. As soon as flowering starts, no more fertilizer. Um, that can really, really mess up your cone chemistry if you're pushing too much nitrogen after flower formation. And the so, flower on a hop co- or a hop plant <clears throat> looks like a little spiky thing, right? Is that what we're looking for? Tiny, we call it, yep, we call it burr stage. So it'll look like a little tiny little bird, like a cockle burr or a burdock burr. And uh, once, once she starts putting out flowers like that, stop nitrogen, stop fertilizer, period. Hmm. Um, 
if you've been feeding her once a week from, you know, 12 or 14 inch vine length until flowering, she's gotten everything she's going to need to produce as heavy as that plant's going to produce. Um, if you're bigger than, than you know, uh, a container grower or, uh, you know, a few plants here or there, you know, if you have a quarter of an acre or something like that, then then our recommendations are a little different. Um, you're not going to get that much soluble fertilizer in the soil without hurting things. So, um, but for what what we usually see for for home brewer gardeners, uh, that uh, watering can with fertilizer in it once a week is usually a good bet. Huh. That sounds easy. I <clears throat> I I gave up on my hops. Uh, and, and, and <laughs> a lot of people do. Don't feel bad. <laughs> in uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, it gets pretty pretty hot and dry in the uh, summertime. Yep. And uh, I've talked about it on, on the show, but I, I had English varieties, I had German varieties, and then I had Cascade. And the English ones were the ones that gave up first. Uh, the uh, the German ones tried to stay in there a bit longer. But they eventually gave up, and the cascades uh, would—they looked pretty good. I mean, they would grow and put on cones, and and uh, they're really pretty to look at. But uh, the cones would dry up around June, uh, you know, mm-hmm. if I, if I didn't pick them. And so mm-hmm. uh, I don't think that. And whenever I used them in a recipe, I didn't I didn't get that cascade impact, and I I just don't think that I was getting. Getting enough good stuff, uh, you know. I don't think the growing season was long enough, or you know, I don't think that it that it was working out for me. You know, and there's a, there's a couple of things there. And remember how I said everything about growing hops is timing. Mm. Uh, everything about growing hops is timing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not not just fertilizer application, but also when we train our plants and when we allow them to emerge. Now, the plant's going to wake up in the spring whenever the heck it feels good and ready to wake up. Um, some plants are going to grow very, very aggressively in the springtime. They, they wake up with a, with a shot, like uh, Cascade can do that, but things like Nugget and Chinook and Brewer's Gold and Galena, uh, the really vigorous North American types, um, will pop up and if we get all excited and we go and we train those uh up our twine and we're we we get them they're hitting the top of the trellis and you know gee whiz it's you know the beginning of june and they're flowering and i've got cone set and and now it's you know the end of june beginning of july and they're going brown what happened what happened was they were allowed to emerge and be trained much much too early Mm. Hops require a few things to flower aggressively and, and to get that ultimate quality and, and aroma. And that is a certain number of leaf nodes on the vine, so a certain number of branches of leaves going up, and that number is usually between 20 and 30. And you want to have that 20 to 30 nodes, leaf nodes, on a vine by the time that it hits the top wire on the trellis by the end of June. Huh. That's when flowering should start because as the days start to get shorter, that's the plant's trigger to flower heavy and set flowers. Wow. If we if we are flowering before that, then we need to retard that growth, set it back by cutting off all the shoots that are coming up above ground. I like to say, for instance, here in south central Wisconsin, I'm usually not training my plants until the second to third week of May. Hmm. And then once they're trained, they're usually off like a shot. And by the third to fourth week of June, they've hit the top wire. They've got side arms branched out and they're getting ready to flower. So you, you, so you're trained, saying if, if you're trained by April, you're much, much, much too early. So you say, so are you saying just chop them off? And don't let them emerge from the from the ground until oh, they, until middle right, of May in that, your area. Well, usually that's when I'm training is the middle of May. So that means they're usually a, I've I'm letting them emerge. I'm I'm done cutting them back literally with hedge clippers or what have you um, by about the first of May. 
so that by the middle of May, they're long enough, usually two, two and a half feet long, so that I can actually train them two or three times around, hmm. around the string. Um, if they're, if I get a very, very warm spring up here in Wisconsin in 2012, we had 80s in the mar- in March, and you know the plants shot up out of the ground. You know I may have to cut them back two or three times in order to get their emergence timing correct. That's interesting because. Uh, the last season or two that I had these, uh, I got lazy and I didn't get out and, you know, I had to hang new twine and, you know, all the stuff that mm-hmm. you need to do. And I didn't get around to it. And so I had these shrubs. <laughs> I had these <laughs> sure. these shru- hop shrubs that were about, you know, the, the binds were about three or four feet long. And I said, right. well, this is a mess. And so I chopped them off. I just chopped them all off. And it seems like I had a, a little better result uh, from letting, from making them start all over again, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a few weeks later. Now, right. are they going to be using up all the nutrients in their uh, in the rhizomes? Should you fertil- keep fertilizing them, even though you're going to chop them off, or how does that? How do you handle that? So that's why you know, cutting back, as we call it, or burning back, if you're using uh, chemicals, uh, is an activity we perform only on mature plants, so plants that are three years and older, because they do have an incredible amount of nutrients stored in their rhizome tissue. And the first buds that break on older hot plants are usually what we call crown buds or aerial buds, and actually you may see them. They're above ground buds, and certainly in in your location, uh, they'd be buds that would go dormant but be above ground over winter. And those buds tend to be less vigorous when it comes to flowering. Uh, So those are usually the first ones that are awake. And by getting rid of those, we're not going to have any problems uh, with those shoots overtaking any of the smaller shoots that might be more uh, bountiful when it comes to flowering. Hmm. Sometimes people call those bull shoots or they call them water sprouts or water shoots. They tend to have very, very, very long, wide internode areas. So those could be 12 or 14 inches between leaf nodes. Um, and that's that's much, much too much distance between leaf nodes. We would want that to be sort of halved. So we want to get rid of those altogether. They're, they perform poorly in terms of setting flowers. Those are edible, aren't they, when they're when they're small? When they're very, very small, and before they start to really leaf out too much, they're absolutely edible. And we usually go through our yard in the spring with those first shoots that pop up, and we'll snap them off, and we'll sell them to local restaurants and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> a little little side industry there. Hey, you got it. As a farmer, you got to make money wherever you can. I hear you. Well, st- while we're still talking about heat... Uh, our buddy Craig Hendry down in Mississippi says best sun slash shade options for us here with 95 degree days, morning sun versus midday versus afternoon evening. So which side of the house do you put the hops on? <laughs> so hops are more about total exposure to sun than they are so much about temperature. So if we're, almost all varieties want six to eight hours of direct sunlight a day. If we've got less than, than let's just say, seven, uh, then you're going to start seeing yield problems. So we don't like to see hops shaded. Certainly shaded from early morning sun. Mm. So west side of the house is a bad idea. Mm. Uh, because we want to drive off early morning dew off the leaves in order to to uh, reduce disease potential, certainly if you're east of the Rockies with downy mildew. Uh, we want to get those plants dried off as quickly in the morning as we can. So if I had a very sensitive variety, like a European-type variety, so, you know, how a tower or saws or something like that, unfortunately in Mississippi they're probably not going to grow all that great anyway. Mm. Um, because they're going to be very heat. I should say it this way. European noble types are very sensitive to large swings between daytime and nighttime temperatures. 
they want something very continental, you know, Czech Republic kind of uh, temperatures where it's, you know, high 80s in the day and and high 60s at night. If it's 95 degrees during the day and then it drops to, you know, chilly at night, that's not great. If it's 95 degrees in the day and it drops to 90 degrees at night, that's not great either, <laughs> <laughs> because those because those hops re, really they shut down. They go into kind of pseudo dormancy in temperatures over eighty eight degrees mm. uh, because they're being too stressed. I would suggest in that situation, number one, plants on the east side, so it's getting early morning sunlight, and then as the air temperature heats up during the day and gets very, very high, then they're shaded from the afternoon high heat fun um, for the for the sensitive varieties. For something like Brewer's Gold or Nugget or Chinook or something that's really aggressive and really vigorous and, and almost bulletproof, uh, that could go on the south side. Even if it is 90 or 100 degrees with reflected heat, they should be just fine. Hmm. And uh, But I would avoid the west side altogether just due to the the too much shade and cool in the morning after a potential heavy heavy dew night. That makes sense. I, you know, I'm feeling guilty there. I, I'm feeling like buying some more uh, rhizomes and starting another <laughs> set of, cr- of Cascade because I, th- I feel I feel like I gave up too soon or I, d- I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was lazy. I didn't I didn't fertilize and uh, you know I I, I let the I just let them go crazy. Uh, so right. you know, I was a bad hop parent. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to pay attention to your girls. <laughs> we tell, as we tell folks in our workshops, you know, like just because they're just because they're infants and and, and can't uh, have a meaningful conversation with you, doesn't mean you put them in a closet, right? Um, <laughs> you got to you got to nurture them and take care of them, and uh, and you know why they'll grow up to be good, strong ladies, and uh, and they'll pay you back in spades. So. Either that, or you know, be like Downton Abbey and get a hop nanny or something. Uh, you could get a hot nanny. Yes, that's that's a potential. Let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> Around here, you're more more likely to get a hoot nanny, but that's another. Yeah, thing. well, that's another thing. <laughs> but speaking of girls and girl hops, I got an email from Billy, <clears throat> who said I purchased eight rhizomes in 2013, two each of Chinook, Cascade, Galena, and Goldings. Both Chinook and Galena plants have done great but only one of my Cascades has produced. The other Cascade and both Goldings have grown vigorously each year and flowered, but never produced a single cone. It wasn't until a few weeks ago that I realized that those plants might be males, and that was why Mm. they never produced. I don't have any photos of their flowers, but from what I remember, they look like photos I've seen online of male flowers. One of the suspected male plants is next to my best-producing Galena, which I noticed had a few seeded cones this year. It sounds like that only happens when there are males in the vicinity. Uh, what do you think I should do? If the plants are indeed males, is there any way to in- induce them to change back to female? <laughs> or should I just pull them out instead? Uh, I'm in San Diego, by the way, Billy says. So does he indeed have male hop plants? He very well may. Uh, so hops are what we call dioecious, right? It's a fancy term for saying yeah, two houses. Uh, it's fancy words for saying it's uh, boys on one plant and girls on another, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to something like a tomato, which has boy and girl parts on the same plant, so it can fertilize itself. So hops require uh, the hop plant that we grow is all female, and the male plant is identical to the female plant until it flowers. That's really the only way you're going to tell a difference. And the the male the male flower uh, you can search online, search engine images for male hops, and uh, it puts out a little. It doesn't grow really big side arms. It puts out real short little side arms with an entire group of tiny little pale green flowers about the size of each flower is about the size of a pea. And uh, that one male hop plant is good enough to pretty much fertilize every other female plant within a quarter of a mile or so. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so boys in the hop yard are bad. We don't <laughs> want any boys with our girls. Uh, just a trouble ensues. So unfortunately, there is no way to make a male 
plant change to a female plant because it doesn't have female genetics. Mm. It's a boy, right? You can't reassign its gender, so you've got to basically get rid of it, and you've got to get rid of all of it. You can't leave any rhizome to in the ground or it's going to pop up again. So usually we're using a systemic herbicide in order to get rid of them. Um, and and the, hopefully the, the, the hop hills aren't very close together because they may have intertwined by now underneath the ground if they're not contained in some way, right? That's why, again, a systemic herbicide on that plant would be the best option. That way it kills off that plant and doesn't harm the next one. Hmm. Um, so that uh, it's, it is a problem, certainly with, with rhizomes, uh, when you don't have 100% confidence of, of uh, that it's a female uh, clone, uh, as you would with a, like a live plant from a greenhouse. But, um, but we, we encounter that in the field every now and again, too, so it's not completely uncommon. But to have that many males with just that few of female you know, rhizomes total is... is uh, that's a stroke of bad luck. Yeah, it's. I just wonder, wonder where you got those from because you. I mean, when you get rhizomes from a manufacturer, you're getting a a clone of a female plant, allegedly. Uh, allegedly. <laughs> and you know, and I mean, it is it is a it is genetically identical to the original cascade or whatever. Um, it's correct. It's it's going to be. It's going to be the whatever the genetics of the plant that it was taken taken from. But if you're if you have let's say, you know, if you're a hop farmer and you've got 900 acres, and you're going out and you're cutting rhizomes in the spring before anything's up, and you're not cutting these rhizomes while the plant's flowering. So when you've got 900 acres and you've got, you know, 900,000 hop plants. Uh, you don't know how many of those in there might actually be males. Hmm. So there is a very high likelihood. I mean, this is not at all uncommon to see this happen, to get male rhizomes coming out of a large cutting. Interesting. Uh, just because they don't know. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, that's tough luck. And it will pollinate. Now, that's different from a hermaphrodite, which some varieties will put out male and female flowers on the same plant. Hmm. Uh, when they're when they're stressed, usually due to due to heat or drought stress, uh, sometimes insect stress. But that pollen t- t- typically is not uh, fertile. It's usually sterile pollen, so it's not going to not going to cross uh, pollinate anything. So, so th- if he's got seeds in his hop cones, <clears throat> you can still brew with those, right? Absolutely, uh, but you got to remember that if you're you know, alpha acid and beta acids and, and oil content is all by weight. Mm. We measure that by weight. So seeds don't add alpha or oils uh, or essential oils. So that means that if you're putting in an ounce and it's got, it's heavily loaded with seeds, you know, you could have, you know, five or 10% of that overall cone weight could be seeds. So you may end up with, with some results that you don't care for just because it's, you're not putting in enough hops. Uh, secondarily to that, hop seeds are very, very high in oil, and not uh, aromatic oil, but but uh, what we call linoleic and linolenic acids, and they're, those are the ones that are usually responsible for rancidity, deer, and also for head loss, um, that, which is another reason why we tend to not want seeded hops in our beer. And also, in theory, if, uh, if Billy got lazy like me and let some of the... Uh the hop cones uh, mature and dry on the vine and they've got seeds in them, could they drop their seeds and you, then you'd have like a cross-pollinated uh, wilder variety growing in your hop field? That's absolutely correct. And every hop seed that forms in a female hop cone is a different genetic expression of whatever the, the recombination between the pollen was and the, the ovum in that flower. So every hop cone that's on there, every underneath every one of those little bracts, every one of those leaf scales, there could be a seed. So there could be 50 or 60 seeds in a hop cone, and every single one of those seeds is going to have a different genetic expression. On the positive side, I guess you could, almost, you, you could sort of accidentally come up with your own amazing hop variety. But <laughs> Well, and that's how, that's how this happens sometimes. Um, you know, as a friend of mine, uh, Blake Crosby at Crosby Hops out west uh, has a new hop variety out called Idaho 7. And it was a wild-type cross. That's exactly what happened in the hop yard. 
Uh, and, you know, Mother Nature's had a few million more years to figure this out than we have, and it just so happens, you know, the the plant that seemed to be growing quite well in his yard and had great burning properties, we keep it. Right? So, voila, Mother Nature gives us a new variety that we didn't really have to fiddle with ourselves. And then you so, patent it, and then you can charge more money for it. <laughs> Uh, no, you can't. Uh, so that's the good thing about Mother Nature. If it's not a deliberate cross, so if we didn't deliberately take this male and this female and force cross them, you can't patent it. Ah. Uh, well, there you go. Right? You can trademark it. <laughs> <laughs> you can say, you know what, only this, you know, only Blake is growing Idaho 7, and that's fine. But it's it's not a patentable sort of thing. David on Twitter says, is there a way to grow Simcoe hops from a dried hop cone, if not any other other <laughs> any other any ideas on how to get your hands on a plant? <laughs> <laughs> if only, uh, right? you got to know a guy uh, that happens to let a box of plants fall off a truck. Um, <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah. <laughs> wink, wink, yeah. Yeah, at 2 a.m. in the alley. Uh, no. There is not. Um, from a biotechnology standpoint, would it be possible to micropropagate germplasm from a dried hop cone? Maybe in the future. <laughs> um, I mean, it, you know, it's akin to, you know, Dolly the sheep. I mean, can you do it? Yeah. Can anybody do it? No. Um so technically, it's possible. Is it feasible? Uh, no, not really. Um, the you know now we're entering the world of plant patents, and and that's uh, one of the former world I used to be in. Um, and friends of mine uh, that design these at the uh, Select Botanicals Group, Jason Pearl, brilliant, brilliant people, and uh, very gracious people. And we had a chance to talk about this exact topic. Uh, you know, can we, as hop farmers outside of the Northwest, get licenses to grow some of these great hops? And, you know, they're, they're building a, a, a brand, right, around Mosaic, around Simcoe, around Amarillo, and they want to be able to control the quality of that brand. And they want to understand first what that plant is going to do outside of the area that it was bred for, which I get. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have my own brand too. And oh, we just don't give away, you know, let anybody put the aroma smart label on their hops because, you know, we work hard for that brand. So I guess to answer his question, no, there isn't. You're not going to get a Simcoe plant. And if you do get a Simcoe plant, you are, in violation of U.S. patent law, mm. uh, and you know, is is you know, John Haas going to come after you for for having a Simco plant in your backyard? Probably not. However, if one did have a plant, that is that is a repository of genetics that could become uncontrolled. Mm. So that person could be selling off rhizomes and cuttings and all kinds of stuff. So. It's a very, very sticky but serious topic. Um, and I don't, didn't mean to bring down the bring the audience <laughs> down here, but uh, but you know, same thing goes for Citra and, like I said, Amarillo and Mosaic and, and the New Zealand varieties. You know, um, those are all patent protected. So, sorry. <laughs> well, well, to get to get more out of the theoretical and 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 more into the practical. Uh, Nathan on uh, Twitter says, how many binds is the right number to let grow on each hill, especially well-established plants? Mm -hmm. That depends on variety. So in general, um, the more vigorous a plant is, the more leaf, the bigger the leaves, the, the, the more aggressive the, uh, the bind growth, the fewer number of binds that you train. Because, again, we're after yield, and yield is, is about making sure you get enough uh, light onto your leaves. And if you have too much shade, and whether that shade comes from structures blocking your plant or too much self-shading from the plant, uh, 
then you can have you can see quite diminished yield. Hmm. So, the ideally, the more in general, these are all rules of thumb because Mother Nature always has exceptions. Um, in general, the more vigorous a variety, so something like again Brewer's Gold, Nugget, Chinook, Glacier, um, Galena, uh, th- those those creatures, Newport, um, Columbus CTZ. Uh, those we tend to train fewer binds per string. So if you're on a, let's say you're on a two-string system per crown, then for those vigorous varieties, I would definitely not train more than three per string. Hmm. And in some cases, something like a Brewer's Gold, I may only train two. And it seems counterintuitive because uh, you think that, boy, the more binds I send up, the more flowers they're going to make, and you know everybody's happy. But it is the exact opposite of that. So how do you... Uh, I mean, it would be easier on the homebrew scale to pay more attention to uh, more binds coming up. But but once you get those initial binds trained and they start running up, uh, mm-hmm. do you come back and lop off any new shoots that are coming up? Yes. And we, we do that. Uh, we don't necessarily do that mechanically. We do that chemically. So once the binds are a certain height, and uh, once, you, once the binds are a certain height, they will exert force over the binds that are sprouting below them. So we call that apical dominance. And as long as you've got, you know, binds on those strings that are about relatively the same height, they're going to exert dominance over any new binds that are going to try and grow up. Um, however, you know, we do have to go, to go back through and make sure we're not getting a bunch of self-training. Uh, because, you know, even... You know, 10% self-training on a hop yard that's got 30,000 plants is a problem. So, but as a on a homebrew backyard garden scale, I mean, that's something you can easily take care of yourself and keep the rest of those binds down. And uh, and ideally, you'll have your your mound or your container or wherever you've got these things planted, uh, weed-free and grass-free all around it, you know, for a good two to three feet. Again, I'm feeling guilty because, uh, <laughs> you know, the first few weeks, you know, uh, when it's nice outside, uh, it's fun to go out and tend the hops and, you know, uh, get the grass that's growing in around the, uh, you know, even even though I put a barrier around the, the, the hop hills there, you know, tend the grass and, and uh, cut off the, the new binds that are coming up. But, you know, but, but by the end of the season, by the, you know, when it's 100 degrees outside, you don't much feel like uh, getting out there. And so, they, you know, they get a little bushy around the bottom by the end of the year. Uh, Welcome to farming, James. That's all i got to tell you. Welcome to farming. <laughs> Curious Fermenter on Twitter says, is it possible to run the, vi- the, the he says vines, but it binds horizontally yep. So that there is a large, or, or if so, there, is there a large production hit? So can you go sideways? <laughs> Be a little sarcastic here. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but, you know, ideally, no. Because that vine growing tip knows exactly which direction it's growing and how high above the ground it is for a, a, a myriad of, of just miracles of physiology but the uh that growing tip the idea of this plant it's genetics that we have not bred out of it is to grow up because its natural habitat is typically growing along uh woodland edges and near streams and things like that so it likes a lot of water likes deep soil but it also grows up um it clamors over everything right so it's looking for the light so if that growing tip is horizontal, that plant thinks it's basically still crawling around looking for something to grow up. Mm. And that means it's going to stay in vegetation mode, vegetative mode versus flowering mode. And while you may have, you know, we call them deck hops or fence hops, they will flower, sure, because the plant wants to reproduce, so it's going to go through its flowering stage. But you are looking at taking a massive yield hit yeah I've, um, I've seen some i've seen some you know hops grown ornamentally as you know on on fences and as sort of hedgerows and you know if they're only four feet tall or so uh i mean they'll grow 
30, 40, 50 feet horizontally and put out gorgeous leaves but absolutely no cones. Yeah, I can testify to that. I, my wife bought some hops from a flower catalog, and they didn't even say what variety of hops they were. It just said hops. Uh, and, so, and this was uh, years ago, and I planted them in the garden, and, you know, I didn't have a trellis or anything, and they just kind of grew into a bush, and they didn't never put any cones out. And so I said, well, this is, you know, after three years, I said, this is a, a waste of space. And so I took great efforts to dig it up, and I threw it in the compost heap, and they've been happy there ever since. Uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> But they, they, they come up and they run along the chain link fence and, you know, I'll get like a handful of cones uh, mm-hmm. every year. But but uh, now I know why. Again, I'm a bad hop dad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not this is not a simple, intuitive crop whatsoever. So and that's one of the reasons as a, as a plant physiologist it attracted me because it's it's absolutely uh, one heck of a of an animal to try and, you know, tame here. So. Um, I'm what, a glutton for punishment. <laughs> One last question from Lloyd on Twitter: Bugs have been eating my leaves. How to protect them from bugs would be good. Doesn't say what kind of bugs. <laughs> yeah, that would help a little bit. Um, so if they're eating his leaves, so let's let's do a little bit of Sherlock here. Um, then if it's actual chewing that's going on, either holes that are popping up in his leaves or uh, which, does it say where he's from by chance? It does not. I can I can look at the profile, okay. but uh, no. I'm just, I'm just curious because if he's got bugs already, then it's probably something, an early season beetle that we call the flea beetle. And it's a tiny little black beetle and it usually feeds in the early morning, very early morning. Uh, and it, you know, if you see one on a leaf, it'll spring out of the leaf or jump like a flea. And it leaves um, little round holes, like almost like somebody took birdshot to your to your hop leaves. Um, and the hops will typically grow out of that. We don't tend to spray anything for those. Um, it's sort of, you know, a little bit of attrition by Mother Nature. Uh, we, we leave those go. If it's an actual beetle that's chewing on the leaves that's you know a much larger beetle like a japanese beetle Mm. or a rose chafer or something like that that's much more of a problem but that's going to be more of a summertime pest um and i would i would suggest that uh that they get a good look see in some pictures to know what what beetle that could be the other thing that could be chewing on leaves are caterpillars and for caterpillar control, if it's very, very bad to the point where they're, you know, defoliating your, your hop leaves, um, you can use a uh, uh, product called BT. It's B is in boy, T is in Tom, um, and it's a bacterium, paragenesis. It, uh, it basically is, is active on killing caterpillars and caterpillars only. If you have a very, very... Uh, bad problem like army army worms or tent caterpillars or something like that just defoliating your plant but um without knowing exactly uh you know more info about the about the potential culprits it's kind of hard to say yeah we we had a problem with uh, japanese beetles uh for a couple of summers a few years ago uh, but we got aggressive with treating uh the plants around the house that they like you know the roses mm-hmm. and the crepe myrtles and and uh such as that and um, boy, they are voracious and then plenty and prodigious and whatever they are. <laughs> Japanese <laughs> beetles. Are... Hmm. Yeah, what you described, James, is, is I think the perfect way to do that is use what we call a trap crop. Because, you know, Japanese beetles love grapes and crepe myrtle and roses before they're going to chew on your hops. And if you can lure them there and, and spray them on those ornamentals versus your, your, uh, your hop plants, you're, you're that much better off. Well, there you go. Well, I feel like I've been through a therapy session. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad hop dad. You're uh, a bad hop dad. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys sell rhizomes as well? Uh, we don't. Uh, we sell live plants now, uh, mostly in volume to the to the uh, to new growers. So you know, unless you need 38 in a tray. I'm not your guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will look forward to uh, seeing you, uh, seeing your website as as you begin to supply directly to homebrewers and 
Mm -hmm. And uh, it sure was fun to talk to you again, and uh, I hope to make my way up that direction uh, again one day. Yep, that would be great. See the new farm, the new processing facility, and all of our other toys here. So, Awesome. Thanks, James. You bet. Thank you. Well, thanks again to James. Check out Gorst Valley Hops. That's G-O-R-S-T valleyhops.com for updates on when Gorst Valley Hops can be purchased directly from their site. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and I'm considering jumping back into the hop growing game uh, to put the tips that we learned this week to the test um, and to assuage my guilt so that, you know, I don't feel so guilty about failing <laughs> as a hop grower. <laughs> In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Or, oh, and by the way, thanks to everybody for the questions during this week's show. Uh, or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by uh, subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping to All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. Uh, you can find our logbooks, too, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that are purchased through the link are Pebble Time Smartwatch Black and Amish Country Popcorn, three bags, one pound each, purple, red, and blue. That's cool. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.